cycle, purchasing health care plans approved in other states. So right now, you can reduce costs in Washington State for health care if I allow small businesses to pool across state lines, individual market people to pool across state lines, purchase the plan approved in Indiana, where they have over 60 health care choices, 60 health care providers in Indiana. We have 30. A lot of more options out there for people to go and get. New choices for small employers. Now, the small employers are the ones that get squeezed the most. Boeing, Microsoft, Warehouser, they sell insurance, right? You have other entities that are in the large insurance group pool, then you get down to the association plans, then you come down to these small employers who are really squeezed and have limited choices to allow them flexibility and options and allow them to have um, mandate light plans. We call them core benefit plans. We're not all of the mandates and include every single camp plan they must provide to their employers, employees, let them choose what they want lower the cost and get them into the system. Because that's the biggest thing that's important is making sure you have the insurance and getting you into the system, even if it includes your mandates. Okay. Down to global plans, this bill actually passed the Senate on a 47 to one vote, and they couldn't get it up for a hearing in the House, which is absolutely amazing how that would work sometimes. But allow young adults a special plan have a core benefit plan targeted specifically at people aged 19 to 34. 50% of the uninsured are in that category. Insurance costs too much for them. So scale the mandates down, create a pool just for those people so they can share their, 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 their rating across that age group. And what I hear from people is, well, on your scaled back plan, you know, you're not going to include a uh, pregnancy. So for a 25-year-old woman to get pregnant, you're on a core benefit plan, it's not covered. So what do you do? Well, the bill that we actually passed out said if you are involved in one of these core benefit plans and you become pregnant, you can automatically bump up to the next level of coverage. You pay a little more, but you're in the system, and then all that prenatal and your pregnancy and the delivery is all covered by your insurance plan. So we tried to look and say, well, what are the problems going to be? So how can we how can we address those to make it flexible? The key is to get them into the system, get them covered. Comprehensive medical malpractice reform. I think we should give it a shot in Washington State. Texas just passed it. They say they've had 1,200 doctors move into the state because of medical malpractice reform in Texas, and they had a similar number of trial lawyers move to Arkansas. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> some people thought it was a good trade out there. Um, health savings accounts for state employees. I like health savings accounts. I think they're a way to empower people with health care decisions. And also, as a highlight as an example of my concern about government run health care. Um, we passed a bill as a legislature sponsored by, sponsored by Kerry Condotta, a small business owner out of Atlanta. To allow state employees health savings accounts, that option. Well, the health care authority, which is our governing body for health care in Washington State, came back to us and said they could not physically provide health savings accounts because their computer system couldn't do it. <laughs> now, I could go down to a lot of insurance companies throughout Washington County right now, advise any of the local market, a small business, and purchase a health savings account. And everybody else seems to be able to figure out how to do it. But for some reason, even though the department was directly a specific piece of legislation to make that option available to state employees, they didn't do it. They just refused. Which is another story about how our government is operating these days. They just refused to do it, and there's no recourse. Um, they allowed a lot of state employees to get it done. So this bill would say we really mean it this time. But what it also says is a state employee could take their money that comes for health insurance and take it into the individual market, go to you know Rice Walls Benefits or the Unity Group or Snapper Schuler or whatever, you know, a couple of them just pick specific ones, and go and purchase it in the local community they wanted to, so they could get that if they wanted, and the state couldn't stop them from doing it. The beauty of it is that it saves a lot of money, because it's ridiculous what you folks pay for insurance for your state legislators, number one. It's about $1,000 a month, it's crazy. You know, give me half of that, let me go purchasing the healthcare in the individual market. You can save money all over the place, you get a better product, people are happy with what they got, and it's an option. You don't require them to do it. It's operator error. Um, this is a controversial one right here, particularly sitting in the St. Louis <coughs> Hospital uh, back in the foundation building. Certificate of Need Appeal. Certificate of Need came into being back in the 1970s during the managed care craze. And basically what Certificate of Need means, the way I try to explain it to folks, is if Safeway had a grocery store in the corner and Hagen wanted to come in and open a grocery store across the street, um, according to Certificate of Need, Hagen would have to go to the government and prove there was a need for another grocery store. And Safeway could block them by saying, we're already selling groceries, there's no need for another grocery store, so prohibit them from doing it. So the people that have the monopoly love it, so they don't want to touch certificate of need. The people that want to innovate and bring these services into the region, 
they want an appeal certificate and need to bring in new ways of doing business. It's um, been repealed in many, many states throughout the country, and they still have rural hospitals, they still have you know, um, facilities to take care of people. Um, but this does allow for innovation. Um, I'll give you some great examples of where emergency room centers are able to provide the service about one third the cost of an ER visit. Saves us money, saves taxpayers dollars, and saves individuals dollars. Core benefit plans, again, it gets back, even if you're not a small employer, a small employee, can you go out and buy a scaled back plan? This one specifically deals with any category provider. And again, it's an option to make available to individuals to buy a purchase, to purchase a health care plan exempt from the any category provider clause, which will reduce cost and make health care more accessible to people who are priced out of the market right now. <coughs> Cutting taxes on health care plans. We currently have a 2% premium tax on health care plans in Washington State. Why am I taxing something that people can't afford? You know, if you need price down the market, why do I have a 2% tax on top of it? Um, we also are looking at the bills to allow tax credits to small businesses that offer up uh, um, insurance to their employees. So if you get a BNO tax credit, if you're a small employer or a mid-sized employer, you're offering health care to your employees. It saves a lot of money. So you have people who are on a health care plan not being able to go to the basic health plan, not on the government plan, so the tax exemption, if it helps to keep those people insured, it works very well and it's actually a good use of a tax dollars by letting people keep their own money. The tenth one here is a state constitutional amendment to protect the rights of Washingtonians, to make their own health care choices. That's more one just telling the federal government that we still believe in states' rights and states should be able to make decisions they think are best for their citizens and not everything needs to come out of Washington, D.C. That one's more, less detail already more. Okay. I'll just finish up this last slide here. Basic health plan. How do you fix basic health plan? So we came into legislation. The basic health plan was set up to help people who are low income get health care insurance, right? Um, no cost. Started out as a $25 million project back in 1990 with about 89, whatever it was. Now it's up to about $250 million a year, but grown significantly over time as money's allocated to it. So what we said was, Let's take care of the problem and make sure we have something that's there for the truly needy. Let's change it from being a program run from the by the government to being a subsidy program for people who are truly in need. So if you're a low-income working person, let's give you a subsidy to go out to the individual market and purchase health care. After we've done all these other reforms, and give you options about what you can go out and buy. So the plan that we put together would have reduced the budget for the um, basic health plan by about 60%. We would have taken people off who were able-bodied between the age of 19 and 34, moved them over to the core benefit plan created through that piece of legislation, and then said to the rest of the people that are on the plan, let's put a subsidy in place to help you get the insurance and transition through to where you need to be. So I believe this plan would have offered more people who are truly in need more assistance and more coverage. What happened in the legislative session, we cut the basic health plan by 40%. So you had to cut people off the basic health plan, right? Well, the way that was accomplished through the bureaucracy at the end of the day was to increase premiums. So, you know, it's one of those things where you hit yourself on the head because the basic health plan is designed to help out the truly needy. Who are the people who won't be able to afford the premium increases? The really poor people. So those are the people who are going to be churned off of the system when the rates go up and they're unable to pay for it. So you end up with the people in the middle class who are still buying into the BHP, and the people who are truly in health are the ones who are the most hurt by what's happening with the BHP reform the way it happened last year. So after we studied the problem, we came up with a solution, and we'll be offering it up again next year see if we can't do that to help out those people who truly need it. So the outcomes, I believe that we went through with all 10 of those pieces of legislation, which are rather than that. If you take all those 10 in total, it would be a fundamental restructuring of our healthcare delivery system in the state in terms of how we operate, how we pay, how doctors are allowed to operate in Washington, how we where we buy our insurance, how and where we get treated, the options that we have. I think at the end of the day, you lower healthcare costs, you provide choices for health insurance. Um, you increase access to quality health care because people would come and innovate here. Doctors would start flocking to Washington State instead of fleeing from Washington State. And at the end of the day, we can strengthen our state's safety at the same time. So that's what we're going to be working on for the next legislative session. Bringing that to Olympia and bringing it around Washington State. This is actually my test market tonight. We're going to be in Spokane and Bellevue and Vancouver and the Tri-Cities and Yakima and Skagit County and Everett um, the next month and a half talking to people about real solutions for health care. To let them know that if you don't like what's happening at the national level, there is another option that exists out there that we can do here in Washington State to help people get access to better health care, have insurance. For those people who are truly in need, a plan to really help you.